All right, y'all, so we're gonna be checking out something interesting. We're gonna be going deep diving into the psychology of money. I see something mentioning Warren Buffett and you all know how I love him. So I'm just really excited to see what's actually going on and what's being said. I'm a huge fan of, of knowledge. I, I like to learn, I like to improve. I like to learn about money. It's so much that I don't know about money. It's so much that I, that I wanna know. I just, I actually love learning, which is crazy because I hated school when I was in school. And then when you get older, see that's when I started to feel like an old head. Like when, when I actually started to love the things that I used to hate when I was in school. It's like, why, why did I ever really hate that? Well, actually the stuff that's in school, like that, that was completely useless, but actually learning things of value is, is fun. So, so yeah, that man said, y'all, we're gonna check out the video, man. Be sure to drop that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you stay updated. And yeah, let's jump into it, y'all. Money, some have it, some don't. Some have mastered it, but most are still chasing it. You may think of money as just numbers and spreadsheets and math, or an equation that needs to be solved. But the real financial decisions are made far away from calculators, around dinner tables with ego, pride, fear, and personal history. The true nature of money is the dance between the cold arithmetic of a spreadsheet and human nature. When it comes to To money, we are complicated creatures, and financial success is not so much about how much you know, but how you behave. This video was inspired by Morgan House. <clears throat> See, I like to think on stuff like that. It's not about how much you know, but how you behave. And like, that's something that probably would have went over my head not long ago, actually. But what one thing that I realized is you all know that I'm on the. I've been on this health journey. I've been on this finance journey. The thing is, like. It's about staying disciplined and actually consistently doing the things that you're setting out to do. Because the hardest thing is once that money starts coming in, doing the right thing with it. Because you work so hard to get to a level where you make a certain amount of money. So when you're making a certain amount of money, it's like, ah, okay, let me take my foot off the gas. We finally doing it. Let, let, me, let me chill out now. But the second that you chill out, that consistency stops. So all the work that led up to you getting to where you are, the second that you stop, now it starts to go down. So you got to ramp it back up again. And it's like a, a repeating cycle of you starting over. And depending on how far you let something fall, you got to start completely over. Um, and that that's often what happens with health. I know I struggle with that when it comes down to health, because when I get stressed out, I don't smoke, drink, nothing like that. So my, my advice is, you know, food. So yeah, that's one of the things that I struggle with personally. So yeah, that 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 was a deep quote, man. That was a very deep quote. Just wanted to you know talk a little bit about that because this is very very important, man. Because your behavior dictates everything in life, man. You got to change your mind. You got to have a healthy mind, and you have to be strong enough to fight against whatever addictions you have. Because we all have some. It's just, I mean, yeah, it's life. So much about how much you know, but how you behave. This video was inspired by Morgan House's amazing book, The Psychology of Money. Let's delve into the strange and human side of money. Your financial DNA, you aren't crazy. We all come from different generations with parents earning different incomes and holding different values. Living in various parts of the world, born into different economic environments with varying incentives and varying opportunities. We all have very different experiences towards money. Take for example the stock market and inflation. People born in 1970 saw an almost tenfold increase in the S&P 500 during their teens and 20s, leading most to have a positive view of the stock market and a higher inclination to invest. People born in the 1950s, however, saw the stock market go nowhere in their teens and 20s, leading to a more negative view of the stock market and less inclination to invest. People born into the 1960s experienced significant inflation during their teens and 20s, leading to a higher awareness and a more negative view of inflation and its effects. People born in 1990 experienced relatively low inflation during their lifetime, leading to less concern and awareness of its effects. A person's experience with the stock market and inflation during their formative years greatly shapes their attitudes and behaviors towards investing and financial decision making. People justify every financial decision they make based on the information they had at that moment and their mental model of the world, which has been passed on to them from their parents and is shaped by their unique life experiences. See, now this is, this is, I love this. I, I love stuff like this. I love really thinking deep about stuff like this because 
I, I grew up in an environment like I, I come from the hood, like the, the south side of Chicago. And a lot of this stuff is not taught. It's not taught in schools. The, our parents aren't educated. They do the best that they can do. They have to go to work to try to pay the bills, keep the lights on. And sometimes that's a struggle, man. Like I, we, we've had to, you know, shower or take baths with like water heated from the stove, all types of stuff, man. It's, it's been rough sometimes. Um, not all the time, but sometimes. And um, yeah, it's like, so you're not worrying about things like the stock market. The, from what I'm told, what I was told growing up when it comes down to the stock market is, yo, that's that that's that thing that all them white people be killing themselves getting into. You you a black boy from Chicago, what you what you think going you think you finna get in there and do be able to do something? Like, no, no. Even the white man can't do that without you know? Like it's always the negative side. Like you stand no chance, bro. You like that's what you're told. And they're not saying that to belittle you, degrade you, or anything like that. They saying that because they want you to in their minds, from their perspective, it's like, you need to do something that's a better use of your time. Like, I'd rather you play basketball, play an instrument. Like, do something more likely for you to succeed, which is crazy when basketball is more likely for you to succeed than, you know, the stock market, where anybody can really thrive if you take the time to put in the work and do the homework. And and it's just, that information is not from the community, within the community that I come from. It's, it's just not there. So it's like one of those things that you really got to, you really got to, I don't even know, like you got to just think different to even want to understand. Like if you from the same place or you from like, you know, like it, black or white, it really don't matter. If you from poverty, you know that that mindset's not always there, you know? Although they can be misinformed, lack information or make bad decisions, their actions make sense to them in that moment and align with their own personal story. According to Household, people do some crazy things with money, but no one is crazy. We all have unique worldviews, and since there is no universally correct way to manage money successfully, none of us are crazy. We make financial decisions based on our personal life experiences and our worldview. Financial decisions are often not made purely on logical or mathematical grounds, but are shaped by your unique experiences and worldview. Be wary of one-size-fits-all financial advice, as what may seem irrational to others could make perfect sense to you. Bro, this this like a com like I like everything that's been said. It's a lot of information that needs to be said, but this seems like a a lot of heavy hitting quotes just back to back to back. That's just like it's so deep that you could just think on this and ponder on this topic, just like chill and talk about this topic with your friends like for a while. Like, well. You know, like, yeah, 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 motivated friends, that is. Like, yeah, not the, what the hoes at? Not those friends. <laughs> Compound Kings. There is no doubt that Warren Buffett is considered one of the greatest investors of all time. What is staggering is that 81.5 billion of Warren Buffett's 84.5 billion net worth was earned after he reached his mid-60s. Housel explains that few pay enough attention to this simplest fact. Buffett's fortune isn't due to just being a good investor, but being a good investor since he was literally a child. As a result of investing from the early age of 10, Buffett was able to harness the power of compounding. So what is compounding in a nutshell? Let's say you invest $1,000 at an interest rate of 8%. Your initial investment would earn you $80 after one year. If you compounded your total of $1,080 at 8% interest the next year, you would now earn $86.4. You've earned money on your initial investment as well as the interest you earned on the principal. An investment compounded over time gains interest not only from the original investment, but also from the interest generated on top of the original investment. The counterintuitive nature of compounding makes many of us not realize how extreme the results can be. Warren Buffett began seriously investing at the age of 10. I gotta hear that again. I want to hear that again, cause that's just like, that was a that was deep. Pounding in and out. I mean, and I know how it works. It's just like I like hearing it explained and understanding and really letting it sink in. Macho. Let's say you invest a thousand dollars at an interest rate of eight percent. Your initial investment would earn you eighty dollars after one year. If you compounded your total of one thousand and eighty dollars at eight percent interest the next year, you would now earn eighty six point four dollars. You've earned money on your initial investment as well as the interest you earned on the principal. An investment compounded over time gains interest not only from the original investment, but also from the interest generated on top of the original investment. The counterintuitive nature of compounding makes many of us not realize how extreme the results can be. Warren Buffett began seriously investing at the age of 10 and had a net worth of $1 million by the age of 30. 
Let's imagine an alternate reality where Warren Buffett behaved more like most young men in their 20s and used a lot of his early income on traveling and a few nice cars. If he started with a net worth of $25,000 at the age of 30 and retired at 60, but continued to generate the amazing returns that he does of around 22% annually, his net worth today would be around 11.9 million, which is 99.9% .9 less than his actual net worth today of 84.5 billion. Warren Buffett's financial success can be attributed to the financial base he built in his early years and his longevity in investing. His skill is investing, but his secret to success is time and the power of compounding. Yeah, and this is also why you have to find a way to, you know, expedite this process because, I mean, a lot of us learn this stuff when we're older, especially when you come from, you know, where we, where a lot of us come from. It's like you don't have the choice to do this when you're younger. I mean, you, you can teach your kids this so they can but you yourself don't have the choice to do that. So now you got to find ways to get your hands on more money, have more active income, figure out more streams of passive income. You got to really grind, master a lot of different skills, test a lot of things, put your money a lot of different places and figure out how to make it. So you ain't taking 60 years to actually make some real money because yeah, mm -mm, nah, people ain't trying to do that. Consider this from another perspective. The richest investor of all time is Warren Buffett. However, in terms of average returns, he is not the greatest. Jim Simons, for instance, is a hedge fund manager who has compounded money at a staggering 66% annually since 1988, a much higher rate than Buffett. The net worth of Simons, however, is 21 billion, which is 75% less than Buffett's. How is this possible? According to Housel, the reason for this is that Simons wasn't able to find his stride in investing until he was 50 years old effectively giving him less than half as many years to compound as Buffett. Halso estimates that if he had invested over a time frame as long as Buffett, his net worth today would be 63 quintillion, 900 quadrillion, 781 trillion, 780 billion, 748 million, 160,000 dollars. It's important not those real numbers, bro. Like, I think they just be like, you ain't got to do that, bro. You could, it, it, it was a lot. Like, that was crazy. To underestimate the power of compounding. No matter how counterintuitive the results of compounding may seem, they should never be ignored. People often focus on short-term gains, overlooking the long-term impact of compounding. Understanding and leveraging the power of compounding is crucial for long-term financial success. It's not about making quick high returns, but about consistent long-term growth. Pessimism and money. Optimism is a belief that the odds of a good outcome are in your favor over time even if there are setbacks along the way. But when it comes to money, we all have a bias towards pessimism that we hold dear in our hearts. Looking back, however, things have generally improved over the years. So what is it about pessimism that we are inclined to embrace rather than optimism? The answer is because good things take time and don't happen overnight. Money is a subject that attracts pessimism for a variety of reasons. Let's start with the fact that money matters to all of us. When we hear about something bad happening in the economy, we're more likely to pay attention. For example, a 40% decline in the stock market over six months is likely to attract attention immediately and may even attract government intervention. However, the incremental nature of a 140% gain over six years can go largely unnoticed. Every year, half a million Americans are saved by the progress of medicine over the last 50 years. Slow progress, however, attracts less attention than quick, sudden losses, such as terrorism, plane crashes, and natural disasters. There are many overnight tragedies, but few overnight miracles. To be practical, we don't have to be pessimistic. Despite setbacks, we can hold on to the belief that over time, the odds of a positive outcome are in our favor. When watching the news highlighting a stock market crash, economic woes, or other money problems, try to remember that things tend to improve over time. Don't let the allure of pessimism cloud your judgment. A balanced reality-based optimism viewed over a longer time horizon is often more rational for long-term success and can reveal opportunities you would miss with a pessimistic outlook. Opportunities you would longer time. I was still processing part of what he was talking about previously. Horizon is often more rational for long-term success and can reveal opportunities you would miss with a pessimistic outlook. Two Forgotten Elements In 1968, there were roughly 300 million high school-age people in the world, and of those 300 million, 
300 students attended a small school in Seattle called Lakeside. Lakeside happened to be the only high school in the world at the time that had a professor with the foresight to lease a computer, the Teletype Model 30. This was no ordinary computer. It was advanced for the time and the type of computer that even graduate students didn't have access to. And for one lucky student at Lakeside, this would change everything. That student was Bill Gates. From 300 million down to 300. That man lucked up and got a computer too? That's crazy. Oh wait, no, 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 this is a whole different guy. Listen, all these rich guys the same because I'm broke. So in 1968, there was roughly a one in a million chance of being a high school student with access to a computer. Bill Gates and his schoolmate Paul Allen would go on to create Microsoft together. Even as a teenager, Gates showed exceptional intelligence, hard work, and a vision for computers unlike anyone else. But going to Lakeside also gave him a one in a million competitive advantage and head start. And Gates is not shy about this. In 2005, he said, if there had been no Lakeside, there would have been no Microsoft. What is not often mentioned in the early Microsoft story was a third member of this gang of high school computer prodigies, Kent Evans. Just as intelligent, just as visionary, Kent could have very well been one of the founders of Microsoft alongside Gates and Allen. However, that would not happen. A mountaineering accident took Kent's life before he graduated high school. The odds of a high school student being killed in a mountaineering accident are around one in a million. Just as the extremely rare stroke of luck would propel Bill Gates and Paul Allen to great success, Kent Evans would experience an extremely rare event with an encounter with what Housel calls the close sibling of luck, risk. Luck and risk are like the winds and the waves that determine the course. It's crazy how, it's crazy how it works. It's like a yin and yang. When something really good is happening, something really bad has to happen too. And for these one in a million things to both happen to one within one group of people, it's it's really crazy. Loss of a sailboat. The sailor can control the rudder and the sails, but ultimately the direction and speed of the boat are influenced by external factors that cannot be fully predicted or controlled. The pursuit of success is full of twists and turns, and the role luck and risk play in shaping our lives is an important perspective to keep in mind. Understanding that success is a complex combination of factors, including both talent and luck, can help us approach our own financial decisions with greater humility and perspective. Be cautious in attributing your own successes or failures solely to your own actions. Acknowledge the roles of luck and risk. When learning from others, try to emulate broad patterns you encounter as opposed to extreme individual examples that often involve a high degree of luck or risk. These extreme cases are not easily replicable. The key to happiness. People want to become wealthier to make themselves happier, but according to Housel, the key to happiness is the ability to do what you want, when you want, with who you want, for as long as you want. The pursuit of material wealth has led to many people working harder and giving up more control over their time, despite being richer than ever before. However, studies show that having control over your life is the most dependable predictor of positive feelings of well-being, more than your salary, house size, or career prestige. Ultimately, you know what I would argue is changing? The ways to make money these days are becoming a little bit more exciting. You got a lot of people making money together doing YouTube. You got a lot of people making money together doing social media. You got you got a lot more fun ways to make money where it's like, first off, the work don't feel like work anyway, but the work damn near ain't, ain't really work. It's something that you would be doing for fun even if you weren't getting paid. It's like it's more careers that exist like that as opposed to like a lawnmower in business who becomes a millionaire and stuff like that. That's work. That's real labor intensive work. Like it's just a lot of, it's a lot more options these days that makes it more enjoyable to where you don't have to sacrifice. Like you can work all day, every day and still just be having a blast, a great life. So you never have to worry about falling off when it comes down to the work and you know you you can you can still live the life that you want to live so it's different like I, I love that what the internet has done in that sense controlling your time is the highest dividend money pays pursuing money without valuing time is like filling a bucket with a hole in it no matter how much water you pour in it it will continue to leak out similarly no matter how much money you accumulate it won't bring lasting happiness if you don't have control over your time and can't enjoy the fruits of your labor
Prioritize gaining control over your time when considering how to use or invest your money. The freedom to do what you want when you want is often more valuable than any material possession. Tail events. Heinz Begruen, a man who fled Nazi Germany and settled in America, became one of the most successful art dealers of all time. He collected a massive amount of art, including works by famous artists like Picasso, Klee, and Matisse. In 2000, he sold part of his collection for over 100 million euros. But what was his secret to acquiring so many masterpieces? Was it skill? Was it luck? According to Horizon, a research firm, great investors buy vast quantities of art and hold onto them for a long period of time. They wait for a few of those paintings to become well known and worth a lot of money, even though most of the paintings they bought were not worth very much. In other words, it's not about being right all the time, but having a diversified portfolio and waiting for just a few winners to emerge. That sounds like almost every financial market that there is. I didn't know that that's how that, how that worked. Same with like Pokemon cards, same with, you know, same with a lot of things in life actually, like crypto, like you just buy a whole bunch of stuff and, and your winners usually outweigh the losers. Perhaps 99% of the work someone like Begruen acquired in his life turned out to be of little value. He could be wrong most of the time, but that doesn't particularly matter if the other 1% turns out to be the work of someone like Picasso. These events are known as long tails, when a small number of events can account for the majority of outcomes. The long tails of Begruen's art collection are what led to his ultimate fortune. The story of Begruen teaches us a valuable lesson about investing and this long tail concept also applies to many aspects of business and investing. The obvious example is venture capital. Most of the startups in a VC fund will fail and lose money for the fund, but all they need are a few outlier startups which make 20 extra turns to make up for these losses. Take Amazon for instance. In 2018, it drove 6% of the returns on the S&P 500 even though it is just one company. And if we look inside Amazon, its growth was largely driven by two tail events, Amazon Prime and Amazon Web Services. These two products alone more than made up for all of Amazon's less successful experiments, such as the Fire Phone or travel agencies. After the disastrous release of the Amazon Fire Phone, rather than apologizing to shareholders, Jeff Bezos said, If you think that's a big failure, we're working on much bigger failures right now. I'm not kidding. Some of these are going to make the Fire Phone look like a tiny little blip. Bezos understands that it's okay to make mistakes and fail with most products if the process creates the 1% of tail event products that drive everything. Tail events are mostly unintuitive and hidden from us. I wanna hear that again. I'm not kidding. Some of these are gonna make the Fire Phone look like a tiny little blip. Bezos understands that it's okay to make mistakes and fail with most products if the process creates the 1% of tail event products that drive everything. Tail events are mostly unintuitive and hidden from us because we only see the finished products and not all the failures along the way that led to that finished product. Hustle in the book uses a real life example of a standup. That is very deep. That, that's very deep. We don't never really notice like the tail events, like, but they, they become huge. They become like Hustle. Everybody probably, well, a lot of people, especially if you're in tech, have heard of AWS and stuff like that, but it's like, you know, all the other stuff. Like, I ain't never heard of that phone. Like, the, I, like which probably would explain the failure there. But, yeah, it's like, I don't, you don't hear much about the, the failures. And, and the successes aren't necessarily praised. It's just something that you know the name of. Amazon Prime. You know what that is. It's like, that makes sense. It really makes sense when you put it into that perspective. You don't know how many times they failed behind the scenes. But the wins make make up for the failures, you know, way, way more. Not comedian. When you're watching the Netflix special, you're probably saying to yourself, wow, this comedian is amazing and hilarious. But what you aren't seeing are all the trial and error failed jokes that the comedian tried out in small clubs all around the country before doing the special. The Netflix special is the 1% compendium of all the tail event jokes that actually made people laugh. 99% of the jokes along the way were probably just okay. When it comes to investing, even though long tails are prevalent, most of us ignore them. When things go wrong, we tend to overreact. As soon as you accept that tails drive, most of us ignore them, probably just okay. When it comes to investing, even though long tails are prevalent, most of us ignore them. When things go wrong, we tend to overreact. As soon as you accept that tails drive everything in business, investing, and finance, you realize lots of things may go wrong, fail, or fall apart. Remember, out of nearly 500 stocks Warren Buffett has picked, only 10 have made the majority of his money. 
Good stock pickers will only be right half of the time. Good leaders will only make good decisions half of the time. The fact that you might be wrong sometimes doesn't mean that things won't work out over time. In the end, the outcome can be determined by only a small number of events. In investing in business, don't... That was a lot of great information. Like, I, I think that all of these are just so heavy hidden and so heavy hidden and full of like knowledge and information and stuff that really make you think like this is one of those ones that you can watch multiple times and really still get value from. This is a really, really good video, a really good video, man. Um, and it, it is, I love the fact that it's, it's about the psychology of money because this really does put you in the right mindset, especially if you're listening to it open to being in that mindset, like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Because I know that there's been a point in my life where I would listen to this and not even understand a lot of it. So to be able to, to be able to relate to it and to be getting things that um, I already necessarily, I know, but, you know, maybe I could be doing better in some of these areas. It's like, this is why it's important to constantly be learning. Be careful what you're putting in your mind and things like that. Like, yeah. Sweat frequent failures or average results. Success often hinges on a few major wins or tail events that outweigh your losses. True wealth first being rich. It's so important to understand the difference between being rich and being wealthy. Richness is about your current income and the things that you own, while wealth is about the financial assets that you have yet to spend. True wealth isn't what you see, but what you don't. It's easy to assume that someone driving a Lamborghini is wealthy, but appearances can be deceiving. In reality, many individuals are living beyond their means and relying on debt to fund their flashy lifestyles. Wealth isn't about the cars you drive, the diamond rings, or the homes you own. It's about those financial assets that you have yet to spend. Accumulating wealth takes self-control and restraint. The diamonds, watches, and first-class upgrades that you decline all contribute to your overall wealth. It's easy to find rich role models who spend lavishly, but true wealth is hidden and therefore harder to imitate. We're conditioned to believe that having money means spending money, but the real key to building wealth is to save and invest the money you have. In fact, the only way to be wealthy is to not spend the money that you do have. The next time you see someone driving a fancy car or living in a big house, remember you can't judge wealth by appearances alone. The true key to wealth is self-control, restraint, building assets, and investing in your future. Aim for long-term financial security by accumulating valuable assets. Rather than equating wealth with material possessions like flashy cars and luxury goods, focus on building true wealth, not just the appearance of being rich. The real price. Imagine you're climbing a mountain with the goal of reaching the peak and admiring the amazing view. Maybe you will get sunshine that day, maybe rain. You may get lost, you may fall and injure yourself. The difficulty of the climb is not always apparent until you're in the thick of it. From the ground looking up, the path to take may seem obvious, but along the way you will certainly need to reassess and change your path to the peak. You are under no illusion, however, that there will be some golden escalator that will safely take you to the peak. You understand before the climb that this uncertainty and risk is just the price you have to pay to get to the top. But when it comes to investing in the stock market, many people think they can avoid the uncertainty and risk and get something for nothing. Household likens the stock market to getting a new car. If you want to get a new car, you have three options. You can buy a new car, buy a used one, or you can steal one. The new car is a higher price, but the reward is greater. Think of the new car like aiming for 12% returns from the stock market. The used car is cheaper, but also comes with less reward. The used car is a much safer investment, but only returns 4% per year. Stealing a car is like trying to get something for nothing. 99% of people would avoid stealing the car because the consequences outweigh the benefits. However, when it comes to the stock market, people seem to be under the impression that they can take option three and steal from the market. They try all kinds of tricks and strategies to get good market returns without paying the price. Attempting to sell right before the dip or buy before a boom. Consider, for example, wanting to earn an 11% return over 30 years in preparation for your retirement. From 1950 to 2019, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has returned about 11% per year. Over those 69 years, however, of course, there have been many high highs and low lows. 
For many, the sight of their investment going up and down can be dramatic, so they try to get in and out quickly without paying the price of volatility and uncertainty over the long term, akin to trying to steal the car. The price you must pay is not just about dollars or cents when investing. It's about accepting the emotions that volatility, fear, and risk can bring. Recognizing that successful investing comes with a price is crucial. The price is not immediately obvious, but you have to pay it, just like you would for any other product. What this has really put on my mind is I want to study the history of crypto. Like, because obviously I believe that crypto is the future, but it doesn't have the same history as the stock market. So you can say the stock market has gone up 11% because it has a historic record of that happening. But the crypto record isn't as... You know, it isn't as established. And it's like, with the highs that the crypto market is at right now, can it really go up higher? How much higher can it go up? It's like, can we really see these numbers that people are expecting? But it's like, historically, I mean, things rise. Things change exponentially. And crypto is that technology where we could see one of these exponential changes in just life. So... Yeah, man, it's it's just crazy to consider that we're at that point where the decisions that we make now is if you're investing, especially like in things like crypto, this could really set you up to have real genuine wealth. It's crazy. So, yeah, I want to do my homework and do my research on some assets, see what I see. Um, yeah, I definitely this made me want to do that the key is to convince yourself that the market's fee is worth it and it's an admission fee worth paying there's no guarantee that it will be but if you see the admission fee as a fine you'll never enjoy the experience be willing to pay the price once you find it view market volatility as an admission fee for the potential of higher returns rather than as a fine for doing something wrong this mindset will help you stick with your investment strategy for longer time periods and during tough times Hedonic treadmills. Enough. No one enough is enough. Become familiar with the concept of hedonic adaptation or the hedonic treadmill. Every time you hit the goal, you keep moving the goalpost further ahead. You need only look at the demise of Bernie Madoff and Gupta, two men who already had everything and were ultra wealthy, but all the money in the world would never have been enough, both resorting to crime to make even more money. The pursuit of wealth and success without a sense of knowing when enough is enough is like climbing a never-ending ladder. No matter how high one climbs, there is always another rung to reach for, and the pursuit can become all-consuming, leading to a lack of happiness and fulfillment. Set a stable goal for what enough means to you. Otherwise, rising expectations will keep you perpetually unsatisfied and prone to needless risks. Be aware of the pitfalls of social comparison. Instead of endlessly comparing yourself to others, focus on what truly brings you happiness and fulfillment. All right, so yeah, this was actually a really, really good video, man. So much information in this one, packed, packed full of, full of great, great content, man. So yeah, that's pretty much it, man. We are gonna end the video right here. Uh, I, I love this video, man. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much it. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Be sure to drop that thumbs up, subscribe, and turn notifications if you are new. And I will catch you all on the next one, fam. Peace out, y'all.